Listen to this. When your children ask in time to come, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Now, how do I link that? Let's go through the story. The children of Israel were crossing the Jordan, and what God did with the Red Sea, He did again. The river Jordan parted. But this time, God gave Joshua an instruction, and that instruction is meaningful to our discussion. He said, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel. Let them go into the Jordan and pick 12 stones on their shoulder. If they put a stone on their shoulder, he's telling us they are not small stones, isn't it? There are things that a man will grant before you pick. And you put it on your shoulder and you take it out and you pile up these stones together. And now what God said later on is quite interesting. When your children see the stone, what will they do? They will ask you, what are these stones? Why would they ask the question? Anybody? Listen to me. The stones under the river will definitely look different from the stones on top of the river. They'll be smoother if you've seen them before. Being under the water, they will have a luminescence to them that is different from what has been on the surface for quite a long while. So they will know these are strange stones, unlike the stones that we have all over here. And then they will ask the fathers, Daddy, these stones, how did they get here? And so, when the children see the stones, the children are going to be curious to know, and then the fathers will have an opportunity to tell them the story of the parting of the Jordan. Do you see what God is doing here? God is looking for a way to relay the information of his greatness from one generation to another. I've used the word there, to relay. So there is a sense in which you follow the Bible characters, but there is a sense in which what you read from the Bible characters, you ask about from your fathers. I say, Daddy, these stones, how did they get here? Daddy, why are these stones smooth? God is giving fathers an opportunity to respond to the curiosity of their children. And in their explanation, they will talk of the greatness of Yahweh. They will talk of the mighty acts in Egypt. They will talk of the parting of the Red Sea. They will talk of the parting of the Jordan. And the children will begin to know the God of Israel. If you've been following me, you will notice I use the word to relay. To relay. Funny. Do you know the last plague that God did in Egypt? The very last one? That is the killing of the firstborn. After the killing of the firstborn, after the Passover, God said unto Israel, Every firstborn in Israel belonged to me. Of all kinds of animal and of human, he told them what can be redeemed and what cannot be redeemed. And then, it's going to be like an annual festival, the dedicating of the firstborn unto the Lord. So at a time, the firstborn will come forth and the kind of ceremony will be done and there will be something tied to his hand and this boy will want to know why, isn't it? Say, Daddy, how come? Why are you tying this thing to my hand? Why are you dedicating the firstborn? God wants the young ones to ask questions. What he asked Israel to do was not for religious purposes. What he asked Israel to do was to give the adult a chance to relay information to the coming generation. When they ask the question, then God, the, the father will have an opportunity again to say to the children, Hey, when we were in Egypt, God took us out with a very big hand. And the last plague was that the firstborn of the Egyptians were all killed. Hey, did God do that? Yes, he did that, son. He must be a great God. That is what God wanted. A time for father and children to exchange information about God. So even if you were not there, you're there because your daddies were there. And this is supposed to make you curious. If God did that in your days, let him do something in our days too. Don't you think the children who listen to such stories will want to know such a God better? I use the word again, a relay. A relay. Now, let me just tell you a bit of history. Do you know they did this? They took all the stones out, they piled them beside the Jordan. They did exactly what God wanted them to do. But 40 years later, 
the children of Israel were in apostasy. What do I mean? They were in idolatry. They were no longer worshipping God. Just 40 years later. Now I ask myself this question, and a good question too. Is it that the children did not see the stones? I bet they saw it. Is it that they did not ask the right questions? Maybe they did. Is it that uh, the fathers had no time to explain to them? I don't know. But something happened. What God wanted did not occur. God wanted the fathers to relay messages about his greatness to the children. I don't know if the children did not ask. I don't know if the fathers did not tell them the story. But it didn't work. For 40 years later, a generation after Joshua, Israel was in apostasy. How do I link it? You can study Bible characters, but you need human characters. Living human characters. You need them to relay the information to you, to ginger your curiosity, to enable you to seek the Lord and find them. I will repeat myself. It's not just about studying James. Peter and Paul, they've been dead for a very long time. It's not about reading their stories. If what they said in the Bible is true, there must be Peter and John alive today. Do you agree with me? There is a biblical Peter, there must be the modern day Peter. There is a biblical Moses, there must be the modern day Moses. And the modern day Moses would be a good relay of the biblical information in a practical, lively form. For life is to be lived, not imagined. There must be somebody living the mosaic life. Somebody living the Peter life. Somebody doing what they did. Who will be an example to the coming generation? A relay. Anybody did the relay race when you were younger? No, we did. Do you know there's something to the relay race? Somebody has this baiting. Is that not what you call it? On your mind, get said, go, and you go, pom, 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 pom. You go, you give it to somebody. Are you there? And that person gives it to another person, and you raise some. Four people race, isn't it? And the last person finished the race. If that last person did not finish well, the whole team has lost. Uh -huh. Do you think they will consider him a winner if he gets there without debating? Huh? No, he won't be a winner. Nobody will think him a winner. If he runs and he gets there and there's no baiting in his hand, they will ask him to go bring it. The race is about the baiting being exchanged. And if a generation fails to exchange the baiting to the other, either because of lack of curiosity in the young one or lack of time in the adult, then that generation is doomed. Are you listening to me? And I perceive, friends, that we are in a generation. I don't know what is wrong with our generation. Here I am. I represent the fathers. And here you are. You represent the children. And we need to settle the question. What is wrong with the relay system? How come we are not examples unto you? Is it because you guys are not interested in our type of life? Or is it because we do not have enough time to stay with you beside the stones to tell you how the stones got there? Questions, questions. But something is very wrong. Something is very wrong. The exchange is not happening. I know you call us secretly old school. And I know we call you the modern era. And I know we look at you with disdain sometimes. Your music, we don't understand. The, your way of life, we don't understand. I still have a problem with anybody who has a pair of jeans and they have to tear it before they consider it modern. It gives me a lot of jibbies. I don't want to wear tongue clothes. I have a lot of problems with somebody who has an underpants and feel it must be shown. I don't understand it. But you understand it. Now, if I'm not careful as an adult, the way you dress will make me pull away from you. Is that not so? And if you're not careful as children, my own old way and uh, old school system will make you pull away from me. Now, if you guys pull away for long enough, you will not have examples. And you remember what I said yesterday, if you do not have examples, you cannot be an example. I don't know if you're catching what we're saying today. That we need to close that gap. I won't tell you today what I think is the reason for it. I can have some answers, 
but the gap is too wide the gap is too wide and the purity of religion is in the olden days how shall we bring the purity of Christianity to the modern days there should be a link the betting should exchange listen to me friends I will tell you Christianity is very difficult unless you have three kinds of relationship in your life what do I call it three kinds of relationship there must be three relationships ongoing in the life of a person if his Christian life and experience is going to be worth anything you know Paul had a disciple in the Bible the name of that disciple is who Timothy is the most common of all of his disciples Titus was one too but Timothy is the one we all know Timothy was able to do what Timothy did because there was a Paul who laid hands upon him can you see that at the time Paul wrote to Timothy he said stir up the gifts that you received by the laying on of my hands are you getting what I'm trying to say Paul laid his hands I love it Paul laid his hands upon Timothy he knew he was depositing something whatever he deposited in that young man he deposited deliberately intentionally and when that guy was not functioning in the gift he wrote to him to say stare it up when I laid my hands upon you I deposited something stare it up it's there now how do you want Timothy to to function if there is not a Paul to show him the way a Paul less Timothy would definitely go into error God did not design it that way are you listening to me God didn't design it that way do you know that's why the apostles say the things are handed on to you do what and to faithful men who will hand it over to others can you see that he handed over to Timothy he asked him to hand over to faithful men and the faithful men will hand it over to others that is the relay one generation passing it on to the other the truth is going to remain pure when there's a divide there's a problem honestly I wish we will have a time when you guys will ask your questions so that I can know how the younger generation thinks and how you guys feel as we begin to tackle the question of why this divide the divide is there do you know why the divide is dangerous I will tell you here your theme is that all of us should be examples that is pointing to something I know inside of all of you are ministries they're there inside of all of you are desires to excel they're there since you love the Lord you want to do something in his kingdom yes but before you do what about apprenticeship what about matthew discipleship what about you following after somebody to learn the ropes it's essential now what we're having is people are just springing up based on simple simple aggressive ambition all the poor guy knows how to do is to speak in tongues and that's all he does you listen to some people you know they do not know the rudiments of homiletics they know nothing about hemenotics they have not learned anything about understanding the bible they pick a scripture they twist it they twist it and twist it and they use a lot of charisma to carry a message of error across to people who are equally blind and that is why somebody will say he said uh, Daboski Daboski the fool and foolish people going to Daboski's church where a guy carries you and blasts you on a chair and you call it deliverance don't you have a Bible now I have no problem with the Daboski guy I have a problem with who discipled him and since nobody discipled him I'm not surprised that there will be nothing in him are you with me it's a relay thing I'm not so 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 eager to know what a man can do I'm not, not not so interested in what ministries he possesses. I want to know the man he's following when Elisha was going to be introduced he said Elisha is here he used to pour water on Elijah's hand and he's good enough if you pour water on Elijah's hand then that man is a good man enough if you pour water on nobody's hand 
then your own hand will lack water too later on. You cannot be an example unless you follow an example. Are you there with me? This relay match is being punctuated. The baiting somewhere is lost. And I said I will tell you about three relationships. And the first one I've mentioned is you need a Paul in your life. A Paul in your life. You do, my friends. You need somebody who can say to you this, how to go about it. I'm not saying you can't know better than your Paul. Actually, my hope is that the people following after me will be better than I. I pray it fervently. May you all preach better. May you have greater anointing. May you do better miracles than I can ever dream of. That means that the race is going on. You may be greater, but then the advantage of your following a Paul is that where he fell, you will not fall. Did you hear me? I, will, I have made enough mistakes in my life. Many of them so costly and painful. It's my desire that any of you will not make the same. Because I want to spare you the pain. I want to spare you the pain. It shouldn't be hard for your generation. If you're sure, you wait and you get the bait. You need a poor. I know there is people dying everywhere and I know the urgency for ministry I know your desire to be a mighty preacher everybody wants to be like Baba Deboye what you do not know that the man started following somebody you want to skip the pain and get to the pleasure doesn't work that way you can get to leadership unless you learn followership because it's only a good follower that can make a good leader. Are you listening to me? I know that uh, this discipleship thing has been bastardized in other places, in many places. Many people, in the name of discipleship, make slaves of men, treat men like uh, caddy junks. Oh, I, know, I know all those things happen. But in spite of all of the abuses of the process, does not mean we should skip it. Because if you skip it, you're going to pay, it, we'll pay for it later on in life. All of you want to be examples, and you should be. Definitely, your lives will be an extension of ours. Say amen. amen. Actually, yes. When we are all gone and forgotten, you guys will be doing stuff. That is why the baiting needs to be in your hands. You need to collect it right. If you do not, you won't even know what to do there. And God will have to keep on reinventing the wheels. Keep on reinventing the wheels. I have a bit of a, a challenge with uh, the Gideon story. You remember Gideon? When we're talking of the Paul and the, the Timothy exchange, Gideon, according to my Bible, was stretching wheat in a wine press. You remember that story? He was stretching wheat in a wine press. Yet when the angel came to him, the angel said to him, Gideon, you mighty man of valor. The angel would not lie. He was a mighty man of valor, but all of his mighty traits and all of that inner courage were wasted because there was no beating. What was he lacking? A beating. So God had to reinvent the wheel. The father did not do what the fathers were supposed to do. Gideon did not know God. So God had to reintroduce himself to, uh, God has to reintroduce himself to Gideon to restart the journey. I'm suspecting maybe we'll have to do that. But it will be after a season of darkness. When some of you will ardently seek him with the whole of your heart. We can avoid that. People who met the Lord are still around. People who walk with him are still around. Your generation is not curious. Their generation is too busy. And between the two busy fathers and the non-curious children, we have our situation. Is anybody listening to me? So I'm not saying it's your fault. Let's just share it 50-50. Will you accept your 50 while I accept our 50 on behalf of my generation? Many of us are too busy. Jumping from Honolulu to Australia, going from place to place, popular everywhere, preaching, leaving the home unattended to. Are you getting me? The people who should follow after cannot follow at your speed. You do not have time to sit down with them. That is the fault of the fathers. And let no father say to me that it is all for the children. What is the use of what you do and all of the gains you bring in 
for your children if they end up wasting it. Where are you? Daddy, why are you not home with your children? I was speaking to some fathers a long time ago and I said to them, you fathers, do you do arm wrestling with your children? Do you ask your children, come do arm wrestling? And you wrestle with them, allowing them to win, then sometimes disallowing them to win, teaching them to know that you win and you lose in life. You don't have time to do that. Do you take them walking? You don't have time to do that. What you are not doing with them, somebody else is doing. At least the internet will do. And the internet has messages for them. You won't recognize your son if you leave him for too long. Are you listening? And because of the gap created by the busy schedules of the father, the children lost interest. And that's your own 50%. You don't ask the salient questions. You want to be like the big boy, but you don't sit down with him to ask him, how did you get there? Because you don't skip class with God. He will promote you from one state to another until you get to the top. You can't just say you want to climb. You don't fly up, you climb. Because when you get there, listen, listen, listen. You know when God took them out of, the, uh, out of bondage in Egypt? God took them by a way, a different way to Canaan. You know what God said? He said he would take them by a way where they would not fight wars. Why? Because if they see war when they are not ready to fight, they will return to Egypt. Which means God knows the measure of your strength. He allows you to see challenges on the measure of your strength. And it would be good for somebody to be there, showing you the rope. There's nothing more comforting than you go to tell somebody, somebody came to me one day, telling me all of his problems, this is happening, this is happening. And all I said is, when it was happening to me, he didn't let me finish. He said, so sir, it happened to you too. The moment he learned that what he was passing through, I passed through. He felt that his troubles were over. The reason many of us die in our problems is because we don't know it's common to men. Go to those adult big boys, they will tell you they were hungry at the time. So you won't think your hunger is because God does not love you. We need to have a Paul, somebody to show us the ropes, somebody to say to us, I was there, somebody to say what is right and what is wrong. I know the characters in the Bible can do it, but you need a living Peter to show you how Peter lived. Did you hear me? A very essential relationship. And then you will remember too that we spoke of Paul. Paul had a friend. What is his name? Barnabas. Not only do you need a Paul ahead of you, you need a Barnabas beside you. Christianity is not supposed to be walked alone. Are you here? There should be a Barnabas beside you Somebody with whom you share experiences. A smile from his face will quicken your spirit. You can experience the, uh, uh, the, the truth of that scripture, iron sharpness, iron, when you have a Barnabas. Can I tell you a, friend, a, a story? I may not tell you the details, but a friend of ours had a problem once. He was passing through a particular species of uh, temptation. And he went inside and he fasted. He fasted. According to him, he said he fasted for seven days, drinking water and blessing himself. He said when he came out on the seventh day, after drinking water only for seven days, he saw that the temptation was still there. You know, there are some, <laughs> there are some situations. Jesus said, deliver us from evil. Because there are some situations where what you need is what? Deliverance. So after doing that, he said he was actually considering quitting ministry. He wanted to call his Paul. But the Paul, as usual, many Pauls are busy. May God forgive Pauls. I think so many Pauls travel too much. They are never available when Timothy needs them. So he said he called some of his friends. He said, as he was praying, Lord, what am I going to do? I have this temptation. I got this issue. I don't want to, I don't want to do anything nasty there, Father. Come and help me. God said, shed light on Satan's hiding place. And what did he do? He said, he called a few of his friends. 
they set a place to meet. It's a coffee shop. And they met in that coffee shop. All of them were sitting down together. And then he said to them, Friends, I call you here not for coffee and sandwiches. I call you here to tell you that I'm passing through something in my life. So he told them what he was passing through. He said, when he finished talking, one of them said, <laughs> So it's happening to you too. And that was the deliverance. The moment they share notes, so you have that problem too, I had that problem, and they talk about it, they said a little prayer. He said when he was going home, the weight was lifted. God did not give us a Christianity in which we can be solo. Friends, seek the Lord alone, but don't be lacking in relationships. If you're lacking in relationship. The power of Satan is in his ability to put a man in a solitary state and finish him. Did you hear me? If he can put a man in a solitary state, he can do what? He can finish him. You need that essential relationship. So, your Paul is a kind of example, and your Barnabas too can be what? A kind of example. Actually, somebody asked me when I was teaching along this line a long time ago. He said, sir, of Paul and Barnabas, which one do you consider most essential? And I said to him, your Paul may not be for life. But if you have a good Barnabas, he could be for life. You know, there's a lot you're going to learn from your Paul. But something can happen after a while, age and death can take him away. Are you there? But your, 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 your Barnabas... That's a friend that stick closer than a brother sometimes. Are you with me? Many of you don't relate in sincerity. You know, when you go to church, you see, I think our churches are too crowded. That is my opinion. Uh, if you ask me the truth, I say, our churches are too crowded for sincerity. Do you know, our division starts before we get to church. When people say, ah, I wore that dress to church last Sunday. I don't want them to think I don't have another. The division starts from there. The pretense. The politicking. And so when you sit down because you're thinking like that, ah, Bori is still wearing that shirt that he wore. Because you think you don't want to wear the same shirt, you will notice those who are wearing the same shirt. Gives you the opportunity to be a bit proud when you relate with them. Our chairs may be next to each other, but there are pillars of division between us. Sincere relationship does, almost does not exist. Now, so somebody is always talking about somebody, and somebody is feeling cheated by somebody, and that is the church. It is more political than PDP. Big issue. In that area of lack of sincerity, Satan has the opportunity of locking individuals down in solitary cells. And dealing with them. You know, when I listen to testimonies in church, I wonder, is that all God is doing? And yesterday, somebody called me from America and they sent a Camry 2012 to me. Somebody shout hallelujah. So God bless you? Is that all of blessing? When will you be able to tell us of the sin you used to sin? That particular thing you do secretly, over which God has given you victory. Do you know why people will never tell that kind of testimony in church? For folks in church will never forget, will never forgive them. Are you there? And since you can tell it in church because it's overpopulated, can't you talk to your Barnabas? Can't you call a friend close by and tell him something is happening? Can't you agree about issues? I say to you, friends, that over the years I've been with the Lord, I've seen private prayers getting more answers than public shoutings. We come to church, we shout. Somebody stay in front. Tell us what to pray about. While we are still praying about it, he gives us another thing to pray about. I've not finished the first prayer. He's giving me ten more. But with my friend, we don't have to hurry, isn't it? I sit down with my Barnabas. We may have only one prayer point. We thoroughly trash it. And that's not all of the beauty. When we are not together, my Barnabas is still praying about that particular point. And we stay before the mercy seat until the answer comes down. The kind of relationship one you need is that one which I say you need a Paul. And number two is what? You need a Barnabas. 
What are we doing? We are trying to make you an example. You can't be an example until you follow examples. So we are having three levels of examples we can follow. There are biblical characters, those who did well, we can follow them. Those who didn't do too well, we learn from them how not to behave. Then, on life, in life, a living Paul to follow. Somebody who is a bit ahead of you. Don't wait on the one the church does. Wait on the one the Lord will lead you to. Did you hear me? There's the one the church is doing. The church is waking up to discipleship. And they are saying, okay, sister so, so, so. Oh yeah, you, one, two, three, ten. Follow sister so, so, so. She's going to be your disciple. And sister so, 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 too is so proud. You know, when, when I hear it, it shocks me. That girl, she's my disciple. She's not your disciple. She's Jesus' disciple. Nobody is nobody's disciple. And that is why Paul the Apostle said, be followers of me. As what? As I follow Christ. I don't like the pride and the arrogance which some people say, that girl is my disciple. Somebody actually said something that gave me a, a lot of jibbies. I don't take nonsense from my disciples. And I look at her. She's never been on the cross before. I don't know. She's never been on the cross before. She's never died before. All you are supposed to teach me is what you know ahead of me. And I am having this duty of watching you. And all I want to learn from you is the items I see in Christ that are manifesting in you. I like to say to people, when you follow a man, follow him with a sieve. I say in Yoruba, I don't know what they call it in Igbo and Ausa, sieve. So when you take the whole of his character, uh -huh, decide that which you want. You don't take a disciple who call and sinker because ultimately you're going to disciple. You're going to discover that however old, however long somebody has been in the Lord, they are still human beings. I know only one perfect human that has ever lived and his name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. A Christian can be a good Christian, but it's not Jesus yet. That is why I'm never disappointed. When that person is good to me, it is Jesus in him. And when it's bad, that is his human nature. And I've learned over the years to take the two together. Are you here? But whether he's human or whether he has wings and he's an angel already, for your own sake, you need a paw. You need a paw. If you're ever going to be anybody's, anybody's example. You need a Barnabas. So we are close by. Sharing your experience. Let me quickly say this. For it is here in my notes. When you ask some people, and, and, and uh, who is your disciple? They say, Look at the wristwatch when you are tired, only 10 minutes. And then you see the Lord Jesus Christ far before daybreak. Maybe you are sleeping in the same hotel or something, and you see the Lord get out of his room, walk somewhere. What is he going to do there? He's going to pray. One hour is praying, two hours is praying, three hours is praying. You don't need anybody to tell you that it is that prayer that makes him more effective in ministry than you. He's spending four hours on his knees or standing under a fig tree and you can't last more than 15 minutes. Anybody ever been there before? One day, and don't laugh at me, I don't like people laughing at me. When I was younger, I said to myself, I'm going to fast. I've had of three days fasting. I heard about it. All the big gym, gym, gym men said, talk about it. Fasting. I said, I'm going to do it three days. Day one was a Friday. I need to tell you that my pastor told me for the first time that I was going to preach in church on Sunday. So my intention was to fast Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. When I finished preaching, I said, no, don't laugh. Some of you are laughing already. Now, when I finish preaching on Sunday, then I'll break my fast. Three days fast. You want to hear the truth? That in Obiyam. First day, 
When I woke up the second day, I thought something was fatally wrong with me. I stood up. My bed tried to stand up with me. Everything was askance. Every time I stand up, the floor will swell. I managed until 2 o'clock on the second day. By 2 o'clock on the second day, I said to myself, the problem is because I was indoors, that maybe if I take a walk, I'll be okay. I took a walk, and I don't know how my leg took me into a canteen. When I got in there, I asked them, what do you have? They said they have a, a cup and they wah. This is a combination I normally would not take. But with a croaky voice, I said, bring it. The woman gave me a cup. She went to bring the ewa. Before the ewa came, some echo disappeared. And you know, when that incident happened, I stood up realizing I am mortal and weak. From then, following after people who fasted, I've been able to do three days, I've been able to do four days, I've been able to do many days. It means I became better because I had a mentor who taught me the ropes about fasting. It's like that, not just about fasting, about praying. So they saw Jesus, they went to the Lord, they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he taught them the principle of prayer. These same people who couldn't pray for 15 minutes, these same people who couldn't do miracles when the Lord left. Huh? Peter was at the gate beautiful. You remember that story? Every time I read it, my head goes up. I can see what has happened to them. They've been introduced to the Holy Spirit until he started to dwell on the inside of them. He looked at the lame man. He said, gold and silver I have none, but what I have. The guy knew what he possessed. What I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Stand up and walk. When the guy was not standing up, what did he do? He went to him, pulled him up. You must stand. You must stand because I said so. He knew what he contained. That is what happens to you when you have a good Paul. And then the Barnabas. Let's go to the very five, final one. The Barnabas you work with. The Barnabas you share with. The Barnabas is somebody you can tell your secrets to. The Barnabas is somebody who is having your experiences. I have a Barnabas. I have a Barnabas. I've had a Barnabas for almost the 30 years that I've been in ministry. We, we talk about everything. We share everything. It's a very, very interesting relationship. The relationship with the man I call my Barnabas has taught me that indeed, iron does sharpen iron. Are you with me? Then, the man unto whom you are an example. You must have your own Timothy. As a Timothy, you must have your Paul. As a Paul, you must have your Barnabas. And as a Paul too, you must have your own what? Your own Timothy. Your own Timothy. There must be somebody looking at you. You know the fact that you know you are somebody's example has a way of making you do better. Anybody know that? The fact that somebody is looking at you. The fact that somebody is learning from you. has a way of motivating you to a higher level of existence. In us, all of us, is humanity. <laughs> and I was talking somewhere. I said, in a little way, your Timothy disciples you. Can you, can, can you reason with that? In a very little way, your Timothy does what? Disciples you. Because it makes you, it makes you live better since you know somebody is looking at you. If you have somebody in your area not too far away from you, you are the one who taught him patience. Huh? And after teaching him to be patient, be patient. When people are aggravating you, please, key into the Holy Spirit. 
Let patience prevail. You are the one who taught him. And so you get to the market and somebody infuriates you. And as you're about to say, are you talking to me like that? You see your... <laughs> you see your disciple, you are only going to change your tone. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. Uh -huh. And the patience that is not in it to you, you will start to develop. These three essential relationships you need if you are ever going to be an example. But let us not forget that the focus of it all is that you must be an example. You must be a what? An example to the believers. Listen to me, my friend. Whatever you don't possess, you cannot give. It's a law we can shake. What you don't possess, you can give. A pastor may go and read all of the books about love. He may have the best sermon notes about love. He may preach charismatically about love. If he doesn't have a loving act, he will not produce a loving congregation. It's automatic. You have to have it before you can give it. These are proven in the life of some people I know. A man came to me a long time ago. We have all known him to be somebody who finds it hard to give. No, he finds it very hard to give. So when he was talking to me, he said to me, Sir, the members of my church don't give. I didn't say much, I just chuckled. And when he asked, what can he do? I said, change. Because if you change, what will happen? They will change. He was thinking I will point him to scriptures or perhaps I will come to his church to come and teach them how to give. If I teach them, they will give when I'm there. When I'm gone, they will stop giving. Because whatever you do not have, you can give. So to be an example, you've got to be. And I'm going to conclude now, putting two phrases close to each other. What did I say? Before you can be an example, you've got to be. There are two things conflicting in all of our lives. The first one is to do. The other one is to be. Did you hear me? To do and to be. But actually, there is not much applause for being. People applaud people who are doing. So we all rush to do. We rush to do. We want to preach. We want to sing. We want to be pastors. I don't know what is wrong with people now. Everybody is taking the title apostle. Anybody notice that? Even small boys are now apostles. Because we all want to do. The title does not pick the man. Some apostles I know do not wear a title. They are. I want you friends to quit attempting to do. Let us aim at being first. To be. Actually, what you're going to do will come visiting when you are what you are supposed to be. The Bible says so. The gifts, the calling, the anointing of God on a man's life will make a way for him. Good product does not need advertisement, you know. You don't need to advertise yourself. It's not of titles. There's something about God in a man. It's like a magnet. Water does not need to ask for people who will drink it. Hunger will push them towards water. Is that not true? You've been, you've been tested before? Anybody ever seen where water is saying, come and drink me, come and drink me, come and drink me? No, water does not talk. The poor thing stays in a bottle in the refrigerator. It's you with your leg that you go there, open it, and you are glad that there is water there. 
If you are that water, folks are going to queue up to drink from you. And it's to be we should focus on. To be that which they need. For they know what they need. To do can end in shape. As you keep on doing and you keep on doing and you keep on doing. And they see you are not what you are saying. They're going to walk away. So I teach my children, you be. For how long will I try to be? Just keep on being. Keep on being. If nobody notices you, you want to hear the conclusion of my treatise? If nobody notices you, know this for sure. God knows who he is. I'll show you two scriptures that shows that God knows who he is. Do you remember when Elijah was at the brute camp? When a, a raven was bringing food to him? After a while, the brook got dried, isn't it? And then God went to Eli Elijah. And God said to Elijah, go to Sarita. Go to Sarita. I have instructed a woman there to feed you. Do you know what is funny? My daughter, that woman has never seen the Lord before. God didn't speak to her. She doesn't know the God of Israel. She was not even a Jew. And Jehovah said, I've instructed a woman there. Who will? Why would God say she's instructed? When God didn't talk to her. It is simply because God knows her character. That she has instructed character. You know when Elijah met this woman. The drama that took place is something we should not forget. Elijah looked at her and said, Hey lady, can I have some water? What is the most discussed thing in Israel there? Water. But because she had the water, what did she do? She turned. I get you water. What she had, she was willing to give. This is not the first time she's giving. God has been watching her for days. God knows this woman will always give if she has. That is instructed character. God, this woman will always give if she has. So he sent his servant to a woman who will always give if she has, but who didn't have. So God is thinking, if I give her, she will give. So I will give her. Are you getting it? He knew her. She was exactly what God wanted. You know, I love that part when the man of God said, and when you're bringing the water, please give me some sandwiches too. And she turned, and I bet she felt sorry. Because this is a giver. This is a woman who will want to give. She's sorry that she can't give. And that was why she went into this long explanation. Hey, I would have loved to give you. I'm actually so sorry I can't. But all that is left in the house is just for me and my son to eat, and then there's nothing else to eat until death will come. Okay, if you are in a state, if you are not a giver, do you see the difference? She is a giver. If you are not a giver, your problem will start with water. Water is scarce. And this man is saying, hey, go get water for me. That's the time to tell him, look at you. That is why you'll be wearing fake priestly cloth everywhere looking for people to devour. 419 prophets. Water call. Water knee. And that, that will be the end of it. But she can do that. She got what she gave. An instructed character. She was what God wanted. Let me show you another person like that. Brother David. I love how God reported to Samuel. said, I found a man. I did what? I found a man. God was not lacking somebody to do. He got saw. God Saul can do. But Saul was not. Saul was not what God wanted. 
to be. Saul was not. So when he saw David, he said, Uh huh, I'm looking for a worshiper, I found him. I'm looking for a courageous man, I found him. I'm looking for a man who loves me, I found him. I'm looking for a man who is fair in his treatment of others, I found him. So he went to Samuel, I found a man, a man who is. Because I say to you, friends, God is not in a hurry looking for people to do his job. He has specific, specific uh, criteria that they must fulfill before you use them. So you don't worry about your being employed by God. The eyes of God is searching to and fro. He's looking for men who are the shape and size he wants. That's why I say to people, you concentrate on being. Concentrate on being like Jesus. Watch the life of my Lord. Watch the revealed nature of Jesus. Check it against your life. Cry unto God to be better. Each day, on and on. When you are, you will find that there is a long queue of thirsty people who have come to you for water. Are you with me? I see many in your generation. <laughs> you know, they look at the geo. The geo is so, so many years. They look at the brother next to the geo. And then the brother next to the geo. And the geo that is next to the geo's geo. And the assistant to the assistant geo. And all of them are in a long queue. And they are looking at themselves. Before this thing will get to me. I'll be 150 years old. <laughs> they look at the long queue to leadership. And when they look at the long queue to leadership. They despair. That is why they branch out and they start a ministry that they are not equipped to run. They look at the long queue of leadership. Why are you bothered? There was a long queue to the leadership of Israel when God picked David. Can't you see? On a good day, it will have been Saul, followed by who? Jonathan, followed by Jonathan's son, and on and on like that. There's no way a David could have been king. But God found. I don't know if you're catching me. It's a long queue, a very long queue. So when you're looking at the long queue and you're despairing, it's because you're political in your mind. You do not know that God does not answer to the politics of men. Mm -mm 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 -mm. He boycotted the entire politics of men. He skipped over the ironic line to pick a Samuel. Do you know that? <laughs> all through Baron, the son of Eli, all, all of them failed. God skipped them, went and picked somebody who otherwise would not have been there, produced, stemmed from the house of Levi, but a Samuel. He has a way of breaking protocols. He does not follow the politics of men, does he? So take your eyes off that lineage. I don't know whichever uh, church you go to, you start to look from the uh, geo to the assistant to the assistant to the assistant and the assistant to the assistant assistant and it's a long queue and you also have a big big ministry on the inside of you and you are wondering in this place when it will be my turn it's your turn when God thinks you are ready to be to be because in a big house there are vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor. I love that scripture. How can you run a house and not have a toilet? A house is no good without a toilet. The toilet is necessary, a vessel of dishonor. You may wash a toilet, it's a vessel of dishonor. You can jick it, it's still a vessel of dishonor. And all of the things you use there, they are still vessels of dishonor. By their shape, they make themselves vessels of dishonor. I won't be hungry enough to eat from a toilet basin. Mm -mm. It's a vessel of dishonor. But in a big house, there are vessels of honor too. In my house, there are some plates that does not come out unless the visitor is important. My wife kept them in a special cupboard with a key. 
And so when some kinds of visitors are coming, these beautiful things come forth. When they serve food in them, you don't know what to eat first, the food or the plates. Very interesting. But when, they, when the visitor is not so visitor, they are the category two. I don't know why women are like that. May God forgive them. <laughs> but the truth is, in a big house, for the big house to maintain its sanity, it must have vessels of dishonor. Are you listening to me? Because if the big house does not have vessels of dishonor, vessels of honor will do dishonorable acts. So in the big house, you need these vessels of dishonor. But God will not say, you are a vessel of honor, you are a vessel of dishonor, you are a vessel of honor. No, 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 no. It's individual who decides whether you want to be a vessel of honor or a vessel of dishonor. It's your decision. That's why the Bible says, if you purge yourself. No, I love that one. It's a general thing. If a man will purge himself from negativity, then it will be a vessel of honor. Do you know what he didn't say? It means in our original state, we are all worthy of dishonor. Did you see that one? In our original state, we are worthy of what? Dishonor. If we don't want to end up in what we were designed to be, from the sin of Adam, we are all designed to be what? Vessels of dishonor. So if we purge ourselves from those natural inclinations that are dishonorable, that is when we can become vessels of honor. So any vessel can be honorable if they purge. And any vessel who refuse to purge, we will use them for what they deserve. Vessels of dishonor. Do you know? <laughs> I was in Bible school and uh, I don't know, the man was 63 when we were in the Bible school together about 30 years ago. So if he's still alive, he'll be 93 now. From Brazil. He didn't speak too much good English because they speak uh, Spanish. He tried to teach me Spanish, but uh, my brain was too busy to learn. One day, I had a problem with a co-student in the Bible school. This is a guy who gave me a lot of serious problems. I don't know why, because we both came from Nigeria. He picked on me. At, and uh, I'm from Udi Olo. I, it's easy for me to beat a man or beat the person he said, in those days. I didn't have the patience to just talk. You can abuse me, but I can break your teeth. So, you know, because I don't talk much. So one day, after he had shown me a lot of paper, that's about 30 years ago, he, it's been a long while he's been belaboring me, making life. I can't tell you some of the things he did. That day I decided, I don't think I will finish in this Bible school. Because I think I got it to here. So I said to myself, it would be a nice idea to beat this guy up. Just beat him so thoroughly, leave him there, and quit Bible school. And so I was in the kitchen, I was trying to clean up. It was my duty to clean up. He came inside and he was doing what he used to do. He was talking in Yoruba. Things, I don't know why he was like that. And when he was talking, I looked at him and I said, I beat you today. He saw my face and I think he realized that he was close to a trash. So somehow he lost his cool. He started moving out of the uh, kitchen. But because I was focused on today, we settled this thing like animals. I was moving towards him. Rage, uncontrollable. Held my heart. But as I was about to approach him, you know when you are somebody who's been fighting before? Do you know if you're a fighter, you know what you're going to do before you get to that person? Yeah, as I was approaching him, I knew what I was going to do. I knew where my first blow would land and what I was going to do. That was all I could think of. Then I heard the voice of my Brazilian friend. He came down from upstairs. He heard that there are a few things happening in the kitchen. He said, Wally, 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 stop! 
respectable. I was just about 30 then. He was 63. So I look at him. I was brought up to respect elders in the first place. So I cool down. I said, Wale, you don't fight. He pointed to him. Come, I'll tell you something. So I followed him to a corner. He said, Wale, in Bible school, there are three kind people. He said, kind one are people who not have anything better to do come Bible school. Number two, are people, somebody tell them, go, they come Bible school. Number three, people send them to Bible school. I was looking at him. He said, God uses number one and number two to make number three perfect. I will never forget it. In life, there are people who will infuriate you. They are supposed to make you perfect. There are people who will make you want to feel bitter. Don't be bitter. They are there to make you perfect if you have the right attitude to it. There are people who just take a look at you and they hate you. And they are willing to tell you they do. Don't react. Just let whatever they do to you produce perfection in you. Now, the Bible says if you purge yourself. Do you know purging yourself may be difficult? So those people who are making life hell for you, they are the people helping you to purge. And if you allow them to do their ministry, and you allow them to purge you of your necessaries, then you will be a vessel of honor. I learned from my Brazilian friend. From them, I see people as teachers. Most of the bad ones. If you have the right attitude to them, they are the people who will help you do the things you want to do. And then you're going to be an example. And when you are an example, don't forget I said so. You won't need to ask for people to come and drink your water. By the time you look out, there will be a long queue of people who wants to drink from you. Wait. That time is coming. But all the while you are waiting, ensure you are the shape and size of a vessel of honor. May God bless you.